Good day, class. Welcome to lecture two of our chemistry of nucleic acid and nuclear proteins. So, in our previous class, we talked about uh, the nuclear proteins, how they are formed, their definition, their absorption. So now we'll be looking at the functions of nucleotides. So, what are the functions, and uh, what are the types of nucleotides that we have encountered in our course in biochemistry? So we have the DNA and RNA synthesis, they serve as the building blocks or the precursor for the synthesis of DNAs and RNAs. They are chemical energy carriers, particularly ATP, because we know that ATP is the energy currency of living cells. So that's what the living cells use for exchange for goods and services. So when we talk about currency in the living cell, we talk about ATP. So we also look at the coenzymes. They actually actually act as coenzymes to in the nicotiamide adenine dinucleotide plus. So that NAD plus means it is the oxidized form of that coenzyme. FAD is flavine adenine dinucleotide, and we have the coenzyme. They are serve as a component of these coenzymes. So ATP. ADP and AIP may function as allosteric regulators and participate in regulation of many metabolic pathways. When we say allosteric regulators, we have enzymes or let's say proteins that behave allosterically. So when we say allos, it means that we have other sites than the active site. So if we say an enzyme is an allosteric enzyme, we mean that that enzyme have both catalytic sites and the regulatory side, such that the binding of an effector to the regulatory side will alter the activities of the enzyme or will affect the conformation on the active side of the enzyme. So they can serve as uh, regulators to either increase or decrease the activities of these enzymes or protein. So they act in, you know, they also participate in regulation of many metabolic pathways. So ATP is involved in covalent modification of enzymes. So, so when we say covalent modification of enzymes, we we'll say, for example, the glycogen uh, synthase or glycogen phosphorylase that are either activated or deactivated upon phosphorylation. So what they use for phosphorylation is the ATP. For example, the conversion of glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, which is catalyzed by hexokinase. That particular step in glycolysis requires ATP. So the, the phosphate group is removed from the ATP to phosphorylate glucose to form glucose 6-phosphate, while the living product becomes the ADP, which is adenosine diphosphate. That means one ATP has actually been removed. And the ratio, the ATP-ADP ratio, also give an implication of the energy level in the cell. So we have the cyclic AMP and the cyclic GMP, which are second messengers in cellular metabolism. You can see that the, the, the cyclic AMP is catalyzed by adenylate cyclase, while the cyclic GMP is catalyzed by granulate cyclase. So these two molecules are second messengers in cellular metabolism. Okay, the formation of activated intermediates in such as the UDP glucose and the CDP diacyglycerol. The UDP glucose, like what you see in the lower pathway, which is in the conversion of uh, galactose to glucose 6-phosphate for energy production. So let's look at the biosynthesis of nucleotides. How do we synthesize these nucleotides? So nearly all living cells, or nearly living or living organism biosynthesize these purines and pyrimidine nucleotides through the novel biosynthesis pathway. I would say the novel means from afresh, new. So many organisms also do the salvage pathway where they actually you know get these purines and these purines and pyrimidines from existing nucleotides. So many of these also salvage uh, purines and pyrimidines from diet and the grazing pathway Purines and pyrimidine nucleotides are, bio, are both biosynthesized by nearly all living creatures via the novel biosynthetic pathway. So many species which is rescue purines and from their diet and degradative 
process. So let's look at uh, the metabolism of purine properly. After we deal with purine, we'll go into pyrimidine. Now we also have the, okay, let's talk about the bio, the biosynthesis of purine nucleotide, the naval biosynthesis. So this is the core structure of the purine ring. You can see we have about four nitrogen atoms, while the rest is carbon. That is the ring. And this ring is contributed by various molecules, which you are going to look in this lecture. So this is the purines and the pyrimidines. For purines, we have two types of purines, which is found in DNA. We have the adenine and the guanine. You can see that the major difference between the adenine and guanine at this position, at this carbon position, we have uh, the nitrogen group. Uh, Why on this carbon we have the oxygen group? So at this carbon we have uh, for guanine we have uh, the nitrogen group. So this are the this is the major difference between the adenine and guanine. So for adenine, the nitrogen group is located at this carbon, while the oxygen group is located at this carbon. So that is the difference between adenine and guanine. For the pyrimidines, we have the, the cytosine, the thiamine, and the uracil. You can see that thiamine, you can see in bracket DNA. So thiamine is found in DNA, but it is not found in arrhenase. What you see in arrhenase is the uracil. So you can see that the the major difference is between this carbon, between this carbon and this carbon. So for cytosine, the nitrogen group is, and, and oxygen group is actually located at both carbon. Why for thiamine, we have the replacement of amino group with oxygen group here and the carbon methyl group at this point. So that is the difference between cytosine and thiamine. For uracil, you can see that uracil is almost the same with thiamine. Of, of fact, it's almost it's the same apart from the CH3 that is located at this carbon. So that's how you can differentiate the different uh, purines. So we have the the nucleoside and nuclei, which I've actually explained in our lecture one. The nucleoside contain the nitrogenous base and the ribose. While the nucleotide contains the nitrogenous base, ribose, and the phosphate group. So that's the major difference. So you can see that for the nucleoside, we have only the we have only the sugar. This is the sugar, which is the ribose sugar. Mind you, this is a deoxy, this is a deoxy ribose because of this, because of this carbon. If there is oxygen at this carbon, we term it as a ribose sugar. But if there is no oxygen, if there is no OH here at this point, we will term it as uh, deoxy. That means there is no oxygen at that point. That means deoxy adenosine. So this is a nucleoside because it contains only the sugar and the nitrogenous base. This is nitrogenous base. So what nitrogenous base is this? This nitrogenous base is adenine. That's why it's called deoxy adenosine. So the same thing we have here. For the nucleotide, we have the deoxy ribose, deoxy ribose, and we have the nitrogenous base, which is adenine. So, if adenine is found with uh, the ribose sugar, it is called the end name is osine, adenosine. If it is uh, a guanine, it will call gua. No sin. It will end with O S I N E. That's one of the nomenclature for the purines. We also get to the nomenclature of uh, pyrimidines. So you can see that the phosphate group is attached here. You can see there are three phosphate group here. There are three phosphate group here. The first phosphate, the second one, and the third one. So that is why we call it adenosine triphosphate. So this is a nucleotide. Even though it is only one phosphate, it is still a nucleotide. But this is uh, these three phosphate groups. So it is I don't know saying triphosphate. If we have only two, only two phosphates, it will be termed I don't know saying diphosphate. I don't know saying diphosphate. 
if it is uh, one, we say it's adenosine. If it is only one phosphate group, we we'll say it is adenosine monophosphate. Now you can see the five prime that is written here. Is that the oxyadenosine five prime triphosphate? The five prime is because the phosphate group is attached to the fifth carbon of the sugar. This is the fifth carbon of the ribose sugar. So if the phosphate group is attached here, it is called the five prime. If the phosphate group is attached at this at this point, at this point, we we'll say it is adenosine. Uh, 3 prime tri 3 prime triphosphate or 3 prime diphosphate or 3 prime monophosphate if the phosphate group is attached at this 3 carbon so this is carbon 2 carbon 3 carbon 4 and carbon 5 so if the phosphate group is attached to carbon 5 it is 5 prime if it is attached to carbon 3 it is 3 prime that is why the dna is from 5 prime to 3 prime or from 3 prime to 5 prime so that actually connects the individual nucleotide that makes up the DNAs or the RNAs. So we have the we have the nucleotides as the building blocks of nucleic acid. So let's look at the structure of the nucleotides. So which we have actually you know defined in our previous slide. So the nucleotide contains this phosphate group which is you can see the five prime have the, the ribose sugar. So this is a, a ribose or 2-oxy ribose. You can see the color here. This color indicates that this is actually where defines if it is a ribose sugar or deoxyribose sugar. Then this is the, the nitrogenous base. This is the nitrogenous base that is found that is connected to the, to the sugar moiety. So this is another nitrogenous base. So this nitrogenous base here is a pyrimidine, while this one is a is a purine. So you can see that it is the uh, for purines, it is the ninth uh, nitrogen group that is attached to the carbon one of the ribose. And because of the hydroxyl group is located for ribose located at this beta position, so it is called N beta glycosyl bond. The N there shows that it is a nitrogen group that is connecting to form the glycosidic bond. The beta there shows the orientation of the hydroxyl group on the sugar, on the ribose. So if the hydroxyl group has the upper position here, it is called beta ribose. If it is located at this hydrogen here, it will be termed as alpha ribose. So now we have the N beta glycosyl bond. So if you ask what is the nature, what is the name of the bond that connects the sugar moiety, the ribose or the oxyribose to the nitrogenous base, what type of bond exists between that point? It is N beta glycosyl bond. So so we have the the novel biosynthesis of. Uh, so this is the main synthetic pathway. We have the biostasis of nucleotide begins very new with the use of small metabolic precursors as raw material. So we have the amino acids, the ribose, uh, ribose 5 phosphate. We have the some of the the one carbon moieties like M for meal. So we have the salvage pathway. This uh, the, the synthesis of the nucleotide by the recycle recycle of the free nitrogen base on the nucleoside released from nucleic acid breakdown this is important to the brain because studies have shown that brain cells do not divide so for the fact that they don't divide they need to use the salvage pathway to regroup or recruit some of the nucleoside that have result from breakdown so we have the de novo biosynthesis of purine nucleotides. The site of purine nucleoside is actually the cytosol in the liver or to a small extent in the small intestine and the thymus. So in all humans, uh, we have the necessary enzyme to synthesize the purine. So we don't need from external source for purine synthesis. Our body can actually survive without the external source for purines. So we have the, the human brain that's the novel biosynthesis 
or cause the most cell cytosol of the with the except the human brain, the polymorphonuclear nucleosides and the erythrocytes. Because of these cells do not undergo mitotic cell division. So because of their undefined nuclear activities, uh, these cells do not undergo the novel biosynthesis, they undergo the salvage pathway to salvage any damage nucleotide or any repair mechanism. So requirements for the novel biosynthesis of purine, purine nucleotides. So we have the purines that are synthesized using the ribose 5-phosphate as a starting material step by step. We have the 5 phosphoriboxyl one pyrophosphate as an active donor of the ribose 5-phosphate. So we call it the PROPP when we are in school. So the brewing ring is synthesized by a series of biochemical reactions that add the carbon and nitrogen atoms to a preformed ribose 5-phosphate. So the ribose 5-phosphate is synthesized as part of the hexose monophosphate shunt or the hexose monophosphate pathway. We also call it the pentose phosphate pathway. Remember the pathway is divided into the oxidative phase and the non-oxidative phase. That step, okay, we, we, we were taught that the pathway has two primary functions. One, the synthesis of, rib of ribose sugar or pentose sugar for nucleic acid biosynthesis, which I'm going to look at in this our current lecture. Two, the production of NADPH for reductive biosynthesis. So that NADPH is actually used for synthesis of fats, cholesterol, or uh, for other cellular activities. So, let's look at the brief of the, the hexose monophosphate shunt or the pentose phosphate pathway. So, you can see glucose is converted to glucose 6-phosphate. The glucose 6-phosphate enters through the distance to be catalyzed by glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase that converts the glucose 6-phosphate to phosphoglucone-lactone. So, but here, you'll be looking at the fructose, the glucose, the, this glucose 6-phosphate or the fructose 6-phosphate can produce in the pentose in a non-enzymatic or non-oxidative pathway of the pentose phosphate or the hexomonophosphate shunt. You can see here, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is acted upon by transketolase. So this, uh, this TK is transketolase. So it's acted upon by transketolase. You can see this is a 3-carbon moiety glyceride three phosphate is joined together by uh, a cis carbon uh, fructose phosphate or glucose phosphate to produce if you look at what is the number of carbon in glucose six carbon what is the number of carbon in glyceride three phosphate three carbon so six plus three will give us nine will give us nine so you can see the product here which is allulose 5-phosphate and erythrose 4-phosphate. So you can see erythrose is a 5-carbon sugar, uh, erythrose is a 5-carbon sugar, while xylulose is a 5, sorry, erythrose is a 4-carbon sugar, while xylulose is a 5-carbon sugar. So you can see that the xylulose is a ketose sugar. So what is a ketose sugar? These are the little things that you should know. A keto sugar, in the nomenclature of keto sugar, we use the word ulus, U-L, ulus, xylulose, ribulose, uh, 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 maybe ribulose, uh, but fructose is an exception to that rule, even though fructose is a keto sugar. So the enzyme that acts on this is a transketolase. It will produce the 5-carbon xylulose and 4-carbon erythrose. So the 5-carbon xylulose, which is an epimer of ribulose 5-phosphate. So the ribulose 5-phosphate epimerase, because the word epimerase shows that xylulose and ribulose are epimers. So what are epimers? Epimers are two molecules that, have ident that are almost identical in, in structure 
up let me not say identical in structure let's say they differ at only a specific carbon atom only at a specific carbon atom if it is more than one carbon atom you can refer them as isomers but if it is at only one carbon that is only one, at one carbon atom the orientation of the functional group they differ we we'll say they are epimers so the enzyme that can convert one epimer to the other epimer is called an epimerase so the enzyme converts xylulose 5-phosphate to ribulose 5-phosphate then the ribulose 5-phosphate is catalyzed by ribulose 5-phosphate and isomerase to give us ribose 5-phosphate you can see that ribose and ribulose are isomers meaning they have the same number of carbon atom the same number of hydrogen the same number of oxygen the same number of phosphorus so they are called isomers so the enzyme that can convert one isomer to the other isomer is called an isomerase so we have the ta here which is transadolase we have the tk transcatalase and the ta the transadolase so the, the transadolase can convert the to glyceride diatrate phosphate uh, and pseudoheptulose seven phosphate convert the, the transcatalase will convert to ribose to ribose five phosphate. You can see the ribose five phosphate here is what we use in the synthesis of greens. So conversion of the five ribose five phosphate to phosphoribose pyrophosphate. So the phosphoribose pyrophosphate is a starting material for purine de novo biosynthesis, and this is formed from ribose five phosphate. So the pentose sugar is always a ribose, which may be reduced to the oxyribose after nucleotide synthesis is complete. So in the beginning of the process, what we have there is ribose sugar. But in the end of when it is complete, that is only when we cannot convert it to deoxyribose if we are interested in synthesizing the DNA. If we are interested in synthesizing the RNA, we will leave it as the ribose sugar. So the 5 phosphoribose one pyrophosphate is also involved in the synthesis of pyrimidine nucleotide, which is the well, also the NAD plus and the histidine biosynthesis. So you can see in this structure here, you can see that the PI means inorganic phosphate. That means the phosphate group is not coming from an organic material like ATP. It is coming as inorganic. It is coming on its own without attached to any molecule. So you can see the uh, the if the this is ribose five phosphate because the phosphate group is attached to the phosphate group is attached to the fifth carbon. So it is ribose five phosphate so the activator so this is the the phosphate group now the enzyme that converts the ribose 5 phosphate to 5 phosphoriboxyl 1 pyrophosphate is called the 5 phosphoriboxyl 1 pyrophosphate synthetase the reason why it is called synthetase note there are synthetase there are enzymes that are called synthetase there are enzymes that are called synthetase the enzymes that are called synthase do not require ATP for their activity. Why the synthetase requires ATP for their activity. So whenever you see an enzyme named synthase, they know that ATP is involved. If it is synthase, know that ATP is not involved in that biosynthetic process. So this enzyme requires magnesium as a cofactor. Why is magnesium as a cofactor? So now the, you can see that the ATP is hydrolyzed to AMP. Now, what is how many phosphate do we have in ATP? How many phosphate do we have in AMP? In AMP we have one phosphate. In ATP we have two phosphates. So you can see in this process, you can see in this process that the there are two phosphate groups that is removed from the ATP. That is why we are having the product as AMP. So two phosphate groups have been removed. And the two phosphate group is attached to the carbon one. You can see this is the carbon one. It's attached to the carbon one of ribose five phosphate. So that is why it's called this is five. This is five phospho because of the phosphate group. Then this is riboxyl, riboxyl, 
then because of these two phosphate groups is attached together to each other it is called a pyrophosphate so and because they are attached to the carbon one that's why you see one pyrophosphate so it is five phosphoryboxyl one pyrophosphate the noble biosynthesis of purine nucleotide means a very little synthesis using the raw material such as the phosphoryboxyl the amino acids, the glycine, the glutamine. This is glutamine. This is glutamine. If it is GLU, it is glutamate. This is glycine. This is aspartic acid or aspartate, as the case may be. This is one carbon unit and carbon dioxide. So these are the starting material. These are the raw material, rather. That is used in the de novo, de novo biosynthesis of uh, purine. So, if you ask what are the, the starting, what are the raw materials that are used in synthesis or uh, the novo synthesis biosynthesis of purines, you can talk about the phosphoryboxyl, the amino acid, glycine, glutamine, and aspartic acid, one carbon unit, and CO2. So nitrogen and carbon source of purines. Purine ring biosynthesis. So in 1948, John Botchanan traced the source of all the nine atoms of purine ring, and if he found out that the the nitrogen in carbon one, the nitro the one the position one is contributed the nitrogen in position one is contributed by aspartic acid which is an amino acid the nitrogen in carbon three and nine is contributed by glutamine the carbon in carbon two and eight is contributed by n10 formula tetrahydrofolate that's thf which is the one carbon unit you saw in the previous slide the carbon four carbon five and Nitrogen 7 is contributed by glycine, while the carbon 6 is contributed by CO2. So these are the element source of uh, purine which we just described. You can see the, the aspartate. You can see this nitrogen is contributed by aspartate. This carbon is contributed by N10 for metetrahydrofolate, which is a one carbon unit. Uh, this nitrogen and this nitrogen is contributed by amide of glutamine. This carbon is contributed by the N10 formula tetrahydrofolate, while this nitrogen group is contributed by glycine. Thank you. This is the end of lecture 2. Do not fail to subscribe to the channel and click on the notification button for more videos on biochemistry. Thank you.